Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I don't think I'm on mute. I um, hope everyone's doing very well. You're all very welcome to our webinar this evening on exploring mental health careers. My name is Amanda. I'm project manager for Welcome Issues. For anyone that isn't familiar with Welcome Issues, it is a mental health awareness and education campaign of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. So we're very delighted to have you all with us this evening. Um, and so many of you are joining us, which is brilliant. Um, just to give you some feedback or suppose some background as to why we wanted to run an event such as this. Um, we decided to do it on this topic because we, I suppose this time of year, we know students are interested in um, exploring different careers and we wanted to offer something in the area of mental health. And then also we get a lot of queries from students as well um, and school staff and parents around this time of year coming up to a CAO deadline, I suppose, about um, just offering some information about the different disciplines and the different areas um, available in mental health to work in and to have a career in. Um, so that was the whole point of this event. So you're all very welcome. We have uh, six different staff members from St. Patrick's joining us this evening. So you're not gonna hear from me for much longer because I know what they're gonna say is, is definitely much more interesting. Um, and we don't want to have to keep you here all night either. I know you're really interested in what they're going to say. So before we get started, I just want to mention a couple of things. We'd love to hear from you during the presentations. So if you have any questions at all, please feel free just to add your question into the Q&A tab. And um, you should see it there on your screen somewhere. Um, and then also, because we have six different speakers, rather than everyone just kind of throwing their questions in, if you could please just reference the discipline that you're referring to. So for instance, if you have a question for nursing, please just type nursing and then your question. Same thing if you have a question for pharmacy, just type pharmacy and your question and then put it in the Q&A tab. Um, now we will do the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So we're going to hear from all of our speakers first and then we'll do the Q&A at the end. But just to mention our first speaker who is Paul Fearon, um, Paul's going to speak, Professor Paul Fearon is going to speak about psychiatry Paul unfortunately can't um, stay until the end of the webinar, so his Q&A will be just after his talk. Now, I know we only have a few minutes uh, for Paul to speak, because again, we want to just keep, just really keep the schedule. So um, if you, as Paul is speaking, please type in your question. You can just say psychiatry, your question, and Paul will endeavor to um, answer as many questions as he can before he has to head off this evening. Otherwise, then we'll go into our rest of our speakers and do Q&A at the end. Um, so our speakers this evening are Professor Paul Fearon, as I said. Uh, Professor Fearon is the Medical Director of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services and Paul is going to talk about um, the area of psychiatry and different types of careers you can have in that area. We're then going to move on to Neve Willis, who is a psychologist in clinical training. Neve is going to talk about the area of psychology. Uh, we then have Grace Adams, who is a nurse in St. Patrick's Mental Health Services. Grace is going to cover the area of nursing. Uh, from there, we're going to go on to occupational therapy. Grace Tutti is um, an occupational therapist in St. Patrick's and she's going to cover that area. Uh, we'll move on then to Elaine Donnelly, who is a social worker in St. Patrick's and she will obviously uh, cover social work. And then last but not least is Grania McElligot, who is a pharmacist in St. Patrick's and Grania is going to do a presentation on pharmacy. So I hope I explained all of that right. It's a lot to take in in the first few minutes, um, but we are really trying to keep to a schedule, like I said. So that's your order of speakers. I know you might be interested in some more than others, but I think we'll go ahead and just jump into our speakers and, and get started. So Professor Fearn, are you, are you okay to get started with your talk? Absolutely, Amanda. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and first of all, apologies that I have to leave early. I have another clashing uh, engagement. Um, uh, but I'll speak um, about the next for about the next ten minutes um, from a psychiatry angle. I suppose there are three angles I'm going to uh, to go at. Um, I'm going to um, there are three choices essentially I had to make in my career, and I'll, I'll reference my career in a, a very non egotistical way, um, just to give examples of things. The first decision I had to make was. Uh, did I want to become a doctor? And then years later, after I became a doctor, um, 
uh, which branch of medicine I wanted to go into and it, uh, psychiatry was what I chose. And then much more recently, and I won't reference this too much, but it just shows the diversity of, um, of medicine and the careers you can choose. Um, I had the opportunity to apply for the medical director post in St. Patrick's, which I've um, been in for just over a year now. Um, and I, so I'll just talk for a couple of minutes about um, the um, challenges and opportunities about uh, choosing a career in psychiatry. So psychiatrists, just for those of you who don't know, are, um, I mean, all the other, all of the speakers this evening um, are working in various aspects of mental health and we all work as teams. Um, the psychiatrist and are the um, people on the team who have a medical degree. Um, they tend to be, um, this isn't very um, complimentary to psychiatrists, um, jacks of all trades and masters of none. We, we have a bit of expertise in everything, but we're not as good, obviously, as psychology, psychologists or occupational therapy or social work, but we tend to have a broad overview of things. We're also the people who make diagnoses. Uh, so for example, we're the people who um, ask the questions and do the investigations to say whether you have bipolar disorder, schizophrenia and anxiety disorder. And we're also the people who are tasked with prescribing medications. Um, I don't know the answer. I know nobody's asked it, but um, how do you know you're um, cut out to be a doctor? I didn't know, to be perfectly honest, that I was going to cut out to be a doctor. I um, got to sixth year in school. When, when, in my day, there was no transition year or gap year. You just went from doing your leaving cert straight into college. Um, but um, I just, um, and my dad was a builder, so there was no family history in my family of anybody uh, doing medicine or anything related to health. Um, but I, um, I just looked through the various options and I honed in on a few and I eventually honed in on medicine. It, it felt like it was exciting, it was diverse. There was a lot of variety in there. Um, I, I couldn't foresee myself what I'd look like or think like as a doctor. Um, and I applied for medicine, I was lucky to, to, um, to be successful. Um, you do five years, as you know, in, in medical school, doing basic sciences, uh, getting your clinical skills worked up, seeing patients, um, uh, et cetera. Then you do a year of um, foundation year training, what used to be called internship, where you do approximately six months in medicine, six months in surgery. And after that, you're a, a fully registered doctor. And then you choose thereafter what branch of medicine you go into. And I suppose that's the first thing I'd really say is that medicine one of the big advantages of medicine is there's a whole set of careers within medicine being a doctor isn't just being a doctor so before we even get on to psychiatry um you you have to choose um whether you want to be a surgeon a physician a psychiatrist whatever um and even within psychiatry there's so many subspecialties i happen to be what's called a general adult psychiatrist which again means i um have a broad expertise uh uh, across all um, disciplines or all uh, uh, parts of psychiatry. But you have, for example, rehabilitation psychiatrists who specialize in getting people with chronic mental health conditions to optimize them and get them back functioning to a level that they might not have been able to attain before. Child and adolescent psychiatrists who concentrate on children and younger people up to the age of 18. Older age psychiatrists who concentrate on people using uh, age 65 or over, particularly those with dementia. Forensic psychiatrists to deal with people who have mental health issues and also have um, uh, problems maybe with uh, legal side of things and may have a history of either violence to themselves or others. Um, so there's a whole set of decisions and they're actually wonderful decision, uh, decisions to make throughout your career. Um, uh, people sometimes feel challenged and rushed into, they feel they have to rush to make decisions as to what they'll branch out into. But I didn't, I did the opposite. I, I always thought it was better to wait a year to make the right decision rather than to rush to make the wrong decision and only find out a year later. It's a really challenging profession um, in many ways. It is tough. Uh, one of the wonderful things about it as well, uh, this isn't changing subjects, it's, uh, is that you're dealing with two things. I'm simplifying things a little bit here, but on the one hand, you, you get trained up to be a, a scientist, if you like. You have to learn the background of how the body, how the mind works, what the latest research is. But then the way you apply that as a doctor is very much on an individual level. And no two people are the same. Um, one of the wonderful things about coming into work every morning and seeing uh, patients and people is that each person's different. You don't really know quite what you're going to be facing when you go into work. Some people might think that's challenging or daunting. It's actually very exciting. No two days are the same. No two patients are the same. Even two patients with the same diagnosis, let's say depression, um, they, don't, uh, they won't present the same way. They won't have exactly the same story. 
it's almost, and I, I sometimes use this analogy, it's not perfect, it's almost like a whodunit, uh, except ex instead of being a detective story where you're ask, uh, asking who committed the crime, you, the question you're trying to ask when you're seeing anybody is, why is this person presenting to me today with this set of symptoms or complaints, and how can I best help them? And there is, with, without wanting to over-egg it, there is a there is a real sense of satisfaction in your job, which I'm not sure can be matched by many other professions in the idea that your job is basically um, down to helping people. Now that also involves, I'll just mention briefly, helping yourself. It, it is a busy, challenging job uh, right through your career. You're always evolving, developing. Medicine doesn't stay still. There are always new challenges, new ways of doing things. So you need to keep up to date. And I think one of the important things in medicine is that you have outside interests. I know that's true for perhaps any profession, but I think it's particularly true of medicine. Um, there's always a risk of burnout. It is an intense job. You're dealing with people on a very human level. People are telling you things as a doctor. It's a very privileged position that they wouldn't maybe tell anybody else, including maybe their spouse, or their wife, or their husband, or their children, or their parents. Um, it's also a, um, a, a profession that travels very well. Um, unlike, let's say, for example, law, uh, where you might, if you went uh, uh, across the water to the States or Australia or wherever, you might have to learn a whole new set of um, things. Medicine is pretty much universal. Um, so it travels very well. So it's a great opportunity to, um, to travel around the world and get experience of how different services operate. Um, it, as I said, no, no two days the same. It's, it's, it's really unpredictable. Um, and I think it's really important um, to, I, I always say that, that um, I joke to people that my career was a set of accidents. I, I accidentally went into medicine. I accidentally went into psychiatry. I accidentally became medical um, director. But in fact, when I look back on it, in fact, um, even though on the surface it appeared accidental, I can remember each moment where I specifically made the decision to become a doctor. I can tell you actually, and, I, and I'll finish on this, uh, the, the point where I'd finally decided to become a psychiatrist. I'd done my psychiatry rotation in final med, my last year of medical school, and I really took to it. I thought, this is a really interesting um, part of medicine. It's, it's one that isn't as clear cut as, for example, surgery. It looks like you need to use your, really use your brains here, not that you don't in surgery. Um, and uh, it appeals to me. But I decided after qualifying in medicine that I wanted to do a few years of general medicine before uh, finally deciding to do psychiatry. I wanted to really become good at physical medicine. So I did my medical membership exams for, for two or three years um, and uh, did various medical jobs. But I remember that the point at which I finally decided, I was in a ward round, I was on general medical um, team uh, in, in one of the Dublin hospitals uh, and we were doing our uh, ward round and we came to a, a 34 year old man who was married with two young children. And he just had a routine x-ray in, in casualty the night before. And his x-ray came back and he had a big lung tumor and even without doing any further investigations it was clear that this man had lung cancer he was a non-smoker it was completely out of the blue he had no idea he had no real symptoms of that and um i knew that my consultant was uh, um, was going to find it very challenging uh, having this discussion and i knew at that moment that was the one thing my, i knew my consultant was better than me in medicine at every single thing that could possibly do but i knew this was something that I could do potentially as well as, as my consultant. Um, and I did, I broke the news to this man. I think I did it reasonably well. I, and at that point I knew this is, this communication uh, side of, of medicine is the, is the one that I can do. And that was essentially when I made my decision to do psychiatry and in my next job, I, I moved into psychiatry. Um, I'll pro perhaps leave it there. I know we're coming just up to the 10 minute mark and I'll open the Q and A and see if there are any uh, questions for me. Um, Paul, I'm happy to call out the questions too. That'd be great, want, Amanda. That'd be um, really Because they're coming Thank in really fast. So I just wrote down yeah, three sure. that I thought were really interesting. Sure. Um, somebody asked, is it ever difficult or a strain on your own mental health hearing other people's struggles and worries all day? I think that's a really, really important uh, question to ask because often people, particularly doctors themselves, think that somehow they should be immune to the stresses and strains of life. I mean, at the moment, if you think about it, um, uh, all health disciplines are 
in uh, under strain at the moment with COVID lockdowns, the effects of on the physical health and on people's mental health uh, of COVID. And of course, it affects us as well. Um, and I think that's why I alluded earlier to the importance of having outside interests or outlets. Um, it can seem very appealing because medicine, you can you, you could you could study and practice your medicine all day and all night uh, to, to become an excellent doctor. But I think it's be, be, being an excellent doctor is being, an, is being a rounded human being, knowing when to switch off. And I think especially the type of things we hear, not only in psychiatry, but in general medicine, the types of things we see, it's really important to have the discipline to switch off at the end of your day. That doesn't mean you're heartless or inhuman or like a machine. It's actually a skill. It helps you to keep your humanity. Um, and I think, especially these days at the moment, it's, it's a really crucial thing to be able to do. Thanks, Paul. And um, another quick one. How long did it take you to complete your degree? OK, so in my uh, day, you did, um, I, it was six years. You had one year of pre-med, which in those days was in Belfield, um, and you did all the basic sciences, ke chemistry, biology, uh, physics, and uh, you, we actually got a little bit of smattering of psychiatry. I think we got a lecture every month. Um, and then we moved to Earlsford Terrace uh, in those days where the main medical school was along with engineering. And we did five years of med medicine. The first three years were the basic sciences. So we didn't actually see a patient until we were four years into medical school, uh, which if you think about it is astounding. Um, you know, so you could, you could be somebody who'd been very good at school and had got the points, but it's only in your fourth year of medical school that you finally talk to a real patient. I know it, that's changed. I think it's five years for most uh, curricula. And for some people who are more mature, they can do um, an accelerated degree if they've done another degree. Um, and they, they get to see patients much more earlier, uh, but it's generally five years. And then after that, you do a year, as I said, of, of foundation year, which used to be called internship, which is six months medicine, six months surgery. Um, when you qualify, you're partially registered on the medical council. And after your internship, you're fully registered. And then that's the beginning of the fun, I'll just say, because then you have to decide uh, what kind of doctor you want to be and then do your training to do your exams in that particular specialty, et cetera, et cetera. Very good. And um, I'll just ask you one more. I know you have to yeah, leave. No, you're fine. Is psychiatry similar to psychotherapy? So um, psychotherapy, um, as I said at the, at the beginning, psychiatry is, um, to be a psychiatrist, you're, you're a doctor first. So you have to do, have done a primary medical degree. Now that doesn't, so some psychiatrists specialize in psychotherapy um, and, and maybe one of the other speech, speakers will be able to, to um, uh, highlight that. But psychotherapy is kind of a, um, a, um, a part of psychology. It's, it's a specific broad, um, term covering a lot of different, for want of a better word, talking therapies. So it could be from the Freudian type of psychoanalysis um, to even uh, the more modern cognitive behavior therapy or interpersonal therapy. So psychotherapy is a broad term for talking therapies, which are um, mainly done by psychologists and uh, increasingly by nurses, but not exclusively by those. As I said, other disciplines can do them too. And they, they, they have their own um, qualifications as well. So that's basically the difference, if that explains it reasonably. Thanks a million. Um, Paul, I know we have lots and lots of questions coming in there, but you, you unfortunately just don't have time this evening. So would it be fair to say to any students, if they do have any questions that they really would like the answers to, they can contact info at walkingmyshoes.com. Absolutely, I, I, and we'll I'll be happy to answer them. Absolutely no problem. And apologies again to everybody for having to leave early. I do apologise. I'd love to be able to stay. That's absolutely fine. Thanks a million, Paul. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Amanda, um, everybody. You're very welcome. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. Before we move on to Neve, I just want to mention if you're tweeting during the event this evening, don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag WIMS webinar. So W-I-M-S, WIMS for Walking My Shoes. And you can tag us at Walking My Shoes. So we're going to move on to Neve uh, Willis. Um, Neve is a psychologist in clinical training and she's going to do her talk on psychology now. Neve, are you okay to turn on your mic? Yes, thanks, Amanda. Um, I might just share my screen there. Sorry, one second. Is that working okay, Amanda? Just to make sure everyone can um, see I that. can see your presentation, Neve, yeah. Yeah, perfect, okay. Um, hello everyone. Um, so my name is Neve Willis and I'm a psychologist in clinical training. Um, and I'll kind of explain that title uh, as I go on in, in my talk. Um, so. Broadly speaking, um, the role of a psychologist in mental health settings is to reduce psychological distress 
and mental ill health and also promote psychological well-being. And how we do this is by applying in our clinical practice with, with our people, with our clients, and um, the skills and knowledge from psychological theory and cycles of training. So very broadly speaking, we work with people's emotions and feelings um, that are associated with some of the kind of difficulties that Professor Paul Fearn mentioned, like bipolar disorder, anxiety disorder, depression disorder, all of those kind of things. Um, we also work with their cognition, so it might be things like their thoughts, their memories, that kind of thing. And we also engage with the behaviours that somebody might um, engage in um, within a kind of mental health um, context. Um, there are kind of four cornerstone um, pillars of uh, our psychology or our kind of like uh, the role of a psychologist in a mental health setting. Uh, and the four kind of key areas are formal assessments and kind of psychological testing due to look at somebody's um, cognitive function. We might assess for specific learning dif uh, dis difficulties like dyslexia. We might assess for things like autism spectrum disorder to see is that present. Uh, we also work in kind of the field of neuropsychology, which looks at the impact of kind of physical brain structures and brain changes and the impact on somebody's functioning, um, on their behavior, on their mental health, their cognition, all those kind of areas. So that formal assessment, psychological testing piece is a really important role um, for a psychologist who works in mental health settings. Um, also, we do assessment of mental health difficulties themselves, mental health difficulties are specifically what their psychological needs are um, and how their mental health difficulties are impacting on their lives and how they need to be supported to, <clears throat> to overcome those difficulties. Um, a really kind of key part of uh, the role of a psychologist as well is formulation. Um, and this this involves working with people to understand what their mental health difficulties are, the things that have happened in their lives that might have made them vulnerable to experiencing different types of distress. Um, we look at the things that might be keeping their mental health difficulties going. Um, so what's keeping them stuck in a place that um, they're very distressed or they're struggling and the things that they're doing well um, and, and the resources that they have at their disposal to try and help them overcome um, their difficulties that they might be having. Um, and then we intervene with those difficulties through interventions or therapies. Um, and this is when we select and apply different models to treat mental health difficulties. So some of these models are some of those things that Professor Paul Fearn mentioned, like it could be cognitive behavioral therapy, it could be dialectical behavior therapy, compassion focused therapy, all sorts of different models. So we select a model that might be appropriate and apply it in our practice to try and treat the difficulties that somebody might be presenting with. And, and we often do this in either one to one capacity in one to one sessions or in group um, in group capacity as well. And um, so the role of psychologist, uh, what's really important uh, about a career in psychology is to recognize that psychologists are scientists practitioners. So everything that we do has an evidence base behind it. So we need to be really familiar with the research about what is effective for treating certain difficulties. Um, and we need to be really passionate about science and applying science in our clinical practice. And this looks like, you know, we engage with research, we read a lot of it, and um, we do lots of research ourselves uh, and conduct research. And we also are really passionate about publishing our research in journals um, and contributing to the evidence base around what's effective for treating different mental health difficulties. So an interest in science is, is really important for um, a career in psychology. Um, I suppose the kind of personal qualities that somebody might need to, to work as a psychologist, um, there's some basic things like somebody would have to have the capacity to be non-judgmental, to be compassionate, um, to be empathetic and warm, um, and also have a capacity to build relationships with other people, and also resilience, just relating back to what somebody had asked already when those questions around just being able to be resilient when dealing with um you know very difficult stories and dealing with localities i think that are really important um if somebody was thinking about a career as a psychologist um, it's a very varied role and we work in lots of different services. Uh, one of the nice things about psychology as well is that we work across the lifespan. So we can work with children and adolescents, adults, older adults, individuals with 
um, intellectual disabilities, all sorts of different presentations. So it's a very diverse um, kind of role and we get lots of experience working with different people. Um, the settings, again, a very, very broad range of settings that we might work in. So we work in mental health settings in the community, we might work in an inpatient setting, we might work in intellectual disability services, autism services, some psychologists work in schools, a lot of psychologists also work in private practice. Um, like all the speakers here today, we work very closely with other professionals on our team, um, like social work and occupational therapy, um, and we work very, very closely with them and, and our work would all try and complement each other, hopefully. Um, so that's a really important part of our role as well as working on a multidisciplinary team. Um, so the career paths in psychology are quite diverse. There are many different types of psychologists. Um, there's clinical psychologists, counselling psychologists, educational psychologists, health psychologists, and, and many more. So I could go on. In mental health settings, it's clinical and counselling psychologists who work in these settings primarily. Um, and all of these psychologists in work in who work in mental health settings who have the title of clinical or counselling psychologists would have an undergraduate degree in psychology. They would tend to have a master's degree in psychology um, and also clinical experience as assistant psychologist um, after they get their master's degree in psychology and then doctorate level training um, in one of the branches. So you'd you would do a doctorate in a specific branch of psychology, either clinical or counselling if you wanted to work in mental health settings. Educational psychologists also train to doctorate level. They do work in uh, mental health settings as well, but primarily they work in schools. So that's the kind of the three main um, branches of psychology, but obviously there's, there's many more. But primarily in mental health settings, it would be clinical and counselling psychologists. Um, just to give you an idea of a career path in psychology, I just have my own path here for, for your information. So I did my psychology degree in Cork uh, in UCC, which took three years. Um, I did a master's in applied psychology, mental health in University College Cork as well. And I also had a placement as part of this um, master's and it's one full year master's. So it's September to September. I then worked as an assistant psychologist with the Irish Prison Service. Um, so I worked in Cork Prison for a year as an assistant psychologist um, and other places for opportunities uh, as work for work as an AP, which is an assistant psychologist, include St. Patrick's Mental Health Services and um, the HSE and so on. Um, during this time as well, I also worked as a research assistant on different studies and also published some of my research um, at this time as well. So after that, you, after you do your degree and your master's, you look for clinical work as an assistant psychologist to build up your skill set to start learning about how to apply that knowledge in your practice uh, and learning how to kind of treat mental health difficulties. And then you go on and you get further training in that area and you specialize into the, the branch that you'd like to be in. So at the moment, I'm doing my doctorate in clinical psychology and I do all my placements in PATS um, but I'm also a, a doctoral student as well which means I attend lectures and I have to put, uh, do a research thesis and um, so I'm conducting research and I have to write that up as well as part of my doctorate so that's where the title psychologist in clinical training comes from when you're on doctorate level training and you're training in a specific uh, branch of psychology um, and finally I just wanted to say that um, I really do love my job and um, you know, it takes a lot of, I think, commitment and determination to to have a career in this area. But if you are determined to have a career in this area, it's really worthwhile. And um, it's really rewarding. Meet lots of amazing people. Um, and I would just really highly recommend it as a career if it's something that you think that you'd be interested in uh, and feel like you can commit the kind of time and motivation that's required to have a career in this area. Um, so that's that's me. Thanks so much, Steve. That was uh, really interesting. Um, and it was great that you gave an example as well of your um, your own um, career path. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to turn on my camera. Um, just to let people know, I know there's lots of question, questions coming in there for you, Neve, but we're doing the Q&A at the end. Um, it was just because Paul had to leave that we did it at the end of his talk. Um, and I know you're going to pull the questions to answer at the end. Um, I would just remind attendees as well, when you're directing your question, if you wouldn't mind just putting in the, the discipline at the start, just so our speakers can pull the questions a little bit faster. Um, so for instance, if you put in psychology and then your question for Neve. So uh, we're going to move on now to uh, nursing. So Grace Adams is a nurse in St. Patrick's Mental Health Services and uh, Grace is going to talk about all things nursing and careers. 
Um, are you there, Grace? Are you okay to turn on your turn on your mic? Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, I am, I suppose, just going to um, touch on the college course, my training and my career so far to give you um, as much of an insight as I can into the nursing career. Um, I am qualified 10 years. I, when it came time to filling out my CAO, nursing was not on my radar at all. Um, it was actually my mum who suggested um, I become a nurse. She's a nurse um, and I suppose she saw some characteristics, I suppose, that are suited to nursing. Um, so I'm glad I, I took her advice. Um, so I suppose to start off, um, nursing is a highly rewarding job. It is very tough. It can be demanding. Um, like that the the question earlier um it's things like your colleagues that make the days easier when you've had had um a hard time and um, you have a great bond with your colleagues and the camaraderie you have makes things a lot easier um but i suppose before we get to colleagues we might talk about the college course so um when i was starting nursing back in 2007 the points were actually only 365 um, last year, I know they were 408 um, to study in Trinity where I did. Um, so the demand is definitely there. Um, we know that this is a job that you are going to always have. Um, it's a well-respected job. So I suppose the CAO points would reflect that. Um, so it's a four-year Bachelor of Science nursing degree. You have to have a science. And I, if I recall correctly, in honours um, in maths. And um, so you have theory and practical um, aspects throughout the four years. The longest practical placement is in your internship. So your fourth year, you have a 36 week long paid internship. And um, so throughout the, the whole career, your whole um, course, it is a hands on, which is great practical experience for you and gives you a good insight into what's involved. Um, so when you, I suppose, initially begin in first year, you're um, asked to put in your requests for where you'd like to, to do your placement. So that would be um, South and West Dublin, Kildare or Wicklow if you, if you attend uh, Trinity. Um, and also Paths is your option there. Um, so I actually went to Tala. Tala was my, my choice. Um, so you, regardless of where you are you get a lot of experience you have shared lectures with other disciplines when you're on placement you also get um the opportunity of two-week placement in a general hospital i had oncology and post-surgical and you also get um a look at intellectual disabilities so another fortnight placement there um it's Great experience, as I say, um, the college course is hard going because of, of um, the practical side of things as well. Um, but I suppose it's, you know, you, you need to fully dedicate yourself to it. And um, while you're on placement, you're still going to have assignments and things like that to be submitted. And um, when I was in college, I worked as a healthcare assistant with a nursing agency because that way I could um, work flexibly while you know, not having um, any of my college work impacted. Um, so as I say, you get different um, inputs and insights into the aspects of nursing. So general ID um, with regards to mental health, you have community and inpatient placements. Um, so community, you could be in addictions or you could just be in a community mental health team. Um, so that is, that's kind of the, the college course. Um, when I qualified, there were no jobs going in Tala. So I applied and thankfully was successful in St. Pat's. So since I've been there, I've worked on um, two different wards, um, both kind of specialist areas. One was the psych of later life and the other was the secure or acute ward. Um, so great experiences to be had in both wards. Um, with the over 65s or psych of later life, you get um, a good 
in, um, experience in the general side of things. So wound um, management, you get to do courses in that, catheterization, um, you know, the blood pressures, the physical health, um, um, and then down in the acute or secure ward, you get, um, you are treating the most severely unwell people. Um, so that that is, I must say, fascinating. So St. Pat's treats um, all forms of, of mental health. Um, so eating disorders, addictions, mood disorders, um, anxiety, schizophrenia all of that and we also have the child child and adolescent ward which is willow grove um, so i am a clinical nurse manager too um, right now in the referral and assessment service so i deal with referrals being sent in uh, from gps and other um, services so again just to point out nursing isn't just um, a 13-hour shift on a ward and um, there's so many opportunities um, in nursing. So it could be um, working as a clinical placement coordinator. Um, so you'd be working with the students when they come out on placement. You can be a community nurse. Um, you could work in addictions. Um, you could be a suicide and self-harm um, prevention nurse in an A&E, a nurse educator. The opportunities really are endless. And in the likes of and um, St. Pat's, they give you the opportunity and really strongly encourage you to, to further your professional development and um, doing different courses, masters, attending conferences, whatever it might be. And um, because ultimately what we want to do is um, provide the most effective and efficient care that we can to our service users. Um, you can also, once qualified, you could do pediatric nursing if you wanted to be a dual qualified nurse do um, pediatrics in 18 months, or you could go to the likes of Edinburgh and do your general nursing in two years. So um, possibilities are endless. Um, much like psychiatry though, this is um, a well-traveled uh, career. You know, the, there's so many Irish nurses um, all over the world because of how, how well we're trained. And um, so it's, I have to say it, it is a, an amazing career. Um, it the rewards um, you get from it, uh, you know, just make it worthwhile. So um, if you are a compassionate and empathic and caring person, then please do consider nursing. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, it's clear you're, you're very passionate about what you do. Um, I'm just trying to get my camera started sorry um zoom <laughs> you think i'd be used to it by now uh, so thanks grace really appreciate it i know you're going to pull some frequently asked questions or some commonly asked questions in the q a box as well and you're happy to answer them at the end so we're going to move swiftly along our next speaker is um so we're covering the area of occupational therapy now so grace Tully, and um, grace is an occupational therapist in saint patrick's and she is going to take the reins now. Grace, are you okay? You're off mute, yeah? Yeah, thanks Amanda, appreciate it. I've really enjoyed listening to Prof Erin, um, Neve and Grace about their roles. So I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about occupational therapy, what it is, and if you're considering a career in OT, why it might be good. So in terms of what is occupational therapy, it's a question I get asked multiple times a day and probably working as an occupational therapist, if you choose to do it, will be a question you're constantly asked. So it's good to have a little bit of a, an idea. So occupational therapists are the healthcare profession that uses therapy or treatment that uses occupations to support a person's health. So Neve in psychology talked about kind of the emotion side of things. We actually look at those occupations or essentially what people do to occupy their time. So we essentially help people to do the meaningful everyday activities that give them purpose and meaning to their life, that their occupations that they either need to do or want to do in day to day living. So we really seek to improve health, well-being and quality of life through people's participation and engagement in their occupations. So anything from going surfing to helping someone um, serve volunteering at maybe a homeless shelter to going to work, to being able to go down to the shops or something as simple as take, of, of having a shower. So we look at all these occupations. We look at what things are important and meaningful to each person. And then we look at kind of helping them do those things day to day. 
So similar to Neve, occupational therapists really seek to help all people of all ages, all cultures um, and all abilities to live life to the fullest. So we work with anyone from zero in the neonatal unit um, to people 100 plus. I haven't had the privilege of working with someone who's zero, but I have had the privilege of working with someone over 100 and it's pretty cool to even look at their occupations. And um, we work with people with all different types of physical disabilities and um, all ranges of abilities, different types of illness, injury, and also people who maybe are adjusting to changes in life, be it someone who's adjusting to retirement, looking at kind of how maybe to get back into work or just kind of adjusting to life's challenges. We really do this by looking at kind of different areas of occupation or looking at those activities. So we kind of categorize them into a couple of different areas. We look at self-care activities, which are the things you do day to day to take care of yourself. So things like um, eating well, being able to make food, sleeping well, um, exercising regularly, being able to get up, get dressed, brush your teeth. We look at kind of activities around kind of leisure time and social life. So enjoying life, having fun, doing hobbies and being with other people and also looking at productive occupations, things like work, college, study, volunteering, caring for others. As occupational therapists, we're trained across both mental and physical health settings. So in college and university, we really do kind of have that dual training where we look at kind of all different types of people from all different types of cultures and are able to work with both people who have physical disabilities and mental health issues or both or all or whatever is going on. So we're really kind of well trained. We do kind of know a lot in a lot of ways and we can work with lots of different types of people. So how we do that is we really look at different aspects of occupational participation and really how we see this is through doing, being, becoming and belonging. So essentially what you do, who you are, who you're going to become and where you belong is really where occupational therapy fits in. So in terms of doing, we see doing as an essential part of being human. It's, we always do something. We're either working, we're playing, we're spending time with friends. Even if we're say we're doing nothing, chances are we're either watching Netflix or scrolling on Instagram. So we're always doing something. And usually when we do things, it's to meet some sort of need or produce some sort of end goal, whether it's writing a sentence for English essay for school or it's meeting friends for a coffee just to catch up. Being then looks at kind of who we are and what we do and our tasks and our occupations are a reflection of who we are as people. So typically being involves our roles, the important roles that we have in our life, such as being a student, being a friend, being a son or daughter, being an occupational therapist and participating in our occupations gives us a chance to be who we are and express that through the tasks that we do. And particularly in mental health, it's a really important part of our role as occupational therapists in mental health to really support people in re-establishing or establishing their occupational roles. Becoming then looks at kind of participating in tasks that also help us develop the person that we're going to be. So, for example, for children, this is even more important because their choices, their successes and their experiences and everyday tasks shape the person they're going to become. Like Grace said, if someone's kind or empathetic, you know, chances are that they might consider a degree in nursing or definitely healthcare. If someone's more into computers and really likes fixing things, maybe an engineer even things like playing sport or playing music, chances are those things are going to continue into adulthood. So actually what we do day to day, it helps us to become who we are. And finally, belonging. So to join with other people in tasks or to share the same values fosters a sense of belonging to a group. So whether this is eating dinner or playing football on the green, it's participation. It's through doing activities with other people that we establish the place in our communities and feel like we belong. So they're kind of the, the areas we look at in OT, very broad, but really, really interesting. So particularly doing OT and mental health or doing occupational therapy and mental health, we look at what people's occupations are. So even just getting to know the person a little bit more, getting to know where they are, what they do day to day, what a typical day looks like for them. Maybe what's impacting on their occupations. So what things are actually going really well, what things are they still able to do, what things are more difficult. So for example, maybe even something like COVID-19 has been seriously disruptive to our occupations and taken away maybe a lot of the opportunities we have to socialize. It might've maybe disrupted work, not being able to go to school. So looking at kind of what are those things, be it someone's illness or disability, be it the environment around them, or be it actually just the opportunities to do occupations. We then look at kind of setting some goals and planning. So looking at what occupations they'd like to do, be it they'd like to join a gym or they'd like to be able to cook spaghetti bolognese or they'd like to be able to find a career that they want to work in. We look at kind of all those different types of things, what occupations they'd like to do, who they'd like to be, where they'd like to go. Planning how someone can use their time well. We do a lot of kind of looking at someone's time, what they do with their time, how can they better use their time to help kind of find that balance in day-to-day -day life. We empower people to make changes in daily living. So be it something small like developing a morning routine or starting yoga practice or being more mindful throughout their day. We definitely focus on what person is good at and their strengths. 
what makes them who they are, what things are actually their values and what things are important to them. And we also kind of look at making changes to the environment to support um, participation in daily, in daily activities. So being an OT, we, like you said, actually, in terms of being evidence-based, we are an evidence-based, client-centered, strengths-focused and occupation-centered profession, meaning that we use our skills and we learn skills related to occupational performance, occupational science, activity analysis and design, environmental analysis, neurophysiology, psychosocial development, group dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of different skills that we use day to day, generally working with people, but specifically as OTs and particularly our focus is on occupations. There's lots of different skills that we need to use particularly in regards to those things. So being an OT um, allows so many opportunities to work across all different types of settings, be it working in inpatient settings like I do in St. Patrick's, working in community settings, so going into people's homes, maybe looking at kind of using kind of just daily kind of life, living in different towns, villages, that sort of thing, being out and about, working in schools, working in residential settings, in working in different workplaces, in universities, in clinics, and also the opportunity to be self-employed or even find a new role that's not maybe a traditional occupational therapist role. And um, there's lots of OTs that are working in business, lots of OTs that are working in kind of um, environmental design, architecture. There's lots of OTs that work in loads of different areas. So there's loads of ways to go with OT, which is one of the reasons why I really like occupational therapy. So here's some examples of what work somebody might do with an occupational therapist particularly in mental health or kind of particularly in the area that we work in so we do a lot of assessment which is kind of just getting an understanding of what's going on for the person who they are what their roles are what their occupations are and figuring out kind of what certain things are impacting on them and then looking at setting some goals to support recovery so what areas they'd like to work on what things they'd like to explore what things they'd like to get better at what things they'd like to change and starting to really talk about those and identify them for the person we then help people maybe learn skills or learn new things related to their goals. We help people make daily activities easier. We help people establish routine and daily structure, which is a big part of where mental health comes in, that actually being able to kind of keep a routine, daily structure has been, is typically a lot more difficult for people. So actually being able to kind of establish those routines and daily structures and really support healthy lifestyle and a balance within that. We encourage people and help people take part in their leisure activities or their social activities, help people engage or re-engage with their community. And a lot of our work, particularly with an inpatient setting, is helping people prepare for transition between hospital and home and making sure and kind of planning so someone can keep well at home, what things they need to do day to day to keep themselves well when they're at home. That's some of the things we do as OTs. So to give a better idea, now every day is different and every OT's day is different, but a typical day in my life. So this morning, for example, I came into work or logged on. Um, check my diary, check kind of what was happening today and what meetings I had, if there's any individual sessions I had to see somebody, any groups I had, and kind of thinking about my day and then planning it. So this morning I met with the, one of the teams I'm on, so I met with the psychologist, the social worker, the consultant, the nursing staff, and we kind of just kind of updated them on kind of what was happening, the work I was doing with a couple of different people, and also I was getting a couple of referrals, so people were kind of asked me would I go and see a couple of people, so I kind of started to organise that. After lunch then, I facilitated a group with a group of young adults in the hospital. So we look today at rest and how we can balance our activity with rest and looking at doing some rest activities. So we did a little bit of drawing, a little bit of mindfulness. And then after that, then I saw one person and I'm here. So every day is different. We usually spend our days either talking about daily activities, doing daily activities, or becoming really excited about someone's daily activities and someone's occupations. Um, there's no day that's either the same. Um, sometimes our weeks might flow similarly. We'll have groups. We might be doing things like a kitchen assessment where we'll be looking at someone's functioning in a kitchen. We might be doing some sort of exercise group or going out for a walk or meeting someone for a coffee. We might be actually sitting down with somebody to plan a return to work or plan their daily week, their weekly planner, the day structure. Everything is different and it's very much dependent on the person. So in terms of becoming a qualified OT, um, when I finished my leaving search, I figured out what I needed to become to become an OT. So for, at that time, it was over 500 points. I think it's gone up a little bit more to about 550. And I know you need a science subject. Um, so I chose biology. Um, within that, then there's a couple of choices. So if you're applying as an undergrad through the CAO, you can do a four year undergraduate degree in either NUI Galway, Trinity College or, Univer or University College Cork. I actually studied in University College Cork. 
If, however, you're a bit unsure about OT and would rather do something a little bit different, there's the opportunity then of doing an undergrad in something else. It could be social science. It could be something completely unrelated to OT, engineering. It doesn't matter. There's an opportunity then of doing a two-year postgraduate degree in occupational therapy. And that means you essentially come out with the same qualification of those who studied four years. It's just an accelerated course. It's the same course, just in a shorter length of time. And there's also um, courses available, particularly around Dublin and other cities of studying to become an occupational therapy assistant. So typically these are kind of shorter courses, but you'd be working with OTs, particularly to maybe facilitate interventions. So it could be groups or one to one interventions to really work with those people kind of under the supervision of the OTs. And um, so that's kind of becoming an OT, particularly in Ireland. All of the courses in Ireland are registered with the World Federation of OTs um, and also with CORU. And that does mean that our um, qualifications are recognized by um, other countries essentially and allowing us to work elsewhere outside of Ireland. So within college, it's not a typical college experience. Um, OT is typically, it's a smaller class group. You do get to know your classmates really well. And that's a fantastic part about OT. And I think it continues when you are working is actually you really do get to work alongside your peer group and get to bounce ideas off and get support from others. There's a lot of workshops and there's a lot of lectures. Yes, by the lecturers at university, but also guest speakers who are typically OTs working in different areas. Um, and they actually provide insights into what life is like for them, what skills they know, what knowledge they need. We do a mix of assignments, research, projects, a couple of presentations. And then within your college degree to spread out between either the two or four years, you do get to do at least a thousand hours practice education placement, which is mean you're sent to an occupational therapist who works and you're working with that occupational therapist. So, for example, myself and one of the other occupational therapists are facilitating a student to come for 12 weeks in the next couple of weeks to work with us to see what we do. And then maybe start to kind of learn some of those skills and um, particularly around OT, starting to do some of the assessments, starting to do some of the interventions um, and us kind of upskill in that area. So it's a great mix of kind of being in college, learning the theory, learning the science and also then kind of doing some practice. Then kind of before we finish, belonging as an occupational therapist. And um, if you do decide to become an OT, you get to belong as one of the coolest communities of over half a million OTs working worldwide. And particularly just qualifying in Ireland does give us the opportunities to work anywhere across the world, including somewhere like the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the US, and so much more. Um, it's a really cool community to be part of. Occupational therapists are great. They're really different. They're so diverse and the areas we work in are so diverse, but it kind of what makes it so interesting about working as an OT. So finally, do you want to become an OT? If you're considering occupational therapy, it is just really important to know kind of why you're going into being an OT. Um, typically, OTs are interested in human behavior and performance. We're interested in what people do, why they do it. We're definitely interested in just learning and getting to know people, their individual differences and their abilities, their personalities, their interests, their strengths, having a good interest and kind of focus on learning and motivation. Also in research, we're constantly looking at the research. We're constantly looking at kind of what's out there and also contributing to it. So you do have to kind of do a bit of research. Definitely working with people, communicating with people is so important being able to teach people well um, and also just core kind of skills and qualities of OTs are typically that we're great problem solvers. We do always kind of tend to go into that fixing mode where we see a problem, we might fix it. And also being creative, that actually being creative, kind of coming up with new ideas, finding new ways of doing things is a huge part of being an OT. So I'll just talk a little bit about why I choose or how I chose to become an OT. So I suppose I was privileged in primary school to be in a very small class with a couple of students of mixed abilities. And I suppose this was just my normal kind of growing up was actually doing school, getting to have friends, knowing people of different mixed abilities and kind of looking at how I could see their strengths and actually just working alongside them. As school kind of progressed, went into secondary school, I started playing an awful lot of sports. So working as a team, working with people, again, something I always did and always do. Um, and I did actually start to like help them, just kind of helping people be coming alongside them, maybe teaching them things, maybe finding out new things and then being creative as well as a big part of, of my secondary school life. Um, in transition year, I actually had the opportunity to work with a group of adults with intellectual disabilities. So how it worked was for a couple of weeks in TY, instead of doing PE, we actually went, a group of us went 
booked the introduction to the disability service and actually did PE with the service users there. So we played games, we practiced throwing and catching, we practiced following instructions, we practiced working with other people. And it actually was one of the highlights of TY, even just seeing how the people progressed, how their skills got better week on week, how they're able to maybe move up in terms of challenges, how they're able to get just to know us and we to get to know them and just kind of get just kind of figure out who they are and what they're about. Um, after that, my mum suggested actually that maybe OT will be something I'd be interested in. Uh, she's a nurse, so she must have seen something. Um, and I began watching YouTube videos on OTs and reading blog posts, anything with occupational therapy I could try to get my hands on, I kind of did read. And then I organised to do two days with two different occupational therapists just to kind of see what they did, sit in in a couple of sessions. One was just a P uh, OT who worked with kids and another was um, those she worked with adults who had experienced stroke and the rehabilitation. I think I quizzed them with about 110 questions, um, but the more and more I learned about it, the more interesting OT has just became to me. And actually, since becoming an OT, it's something that I still just kind of really gives me the, the pleasure and the passion for what I do. So I applied for the CAO. I had first choice was to do um, OT in Cork um, and I was offered the place there. So throughout my placement, we got to listen to a couple of guest OTs. Actually, one of the OTs from St. Patrick's came and um, presented on their work in Pats, which is really interesting. Kind of one of the ones I found really, really interesting. And throughout my college degree, I had placements in physical disability with working with children, working in community and adult settings, so primary care, and then working in a specialised dementia unit um, and delight dementia unit in my final year placement. After college, I then was offered a job in St. Patrick's and I've been working in acute mental health um, since. So if you want any more information or just want to know a little bit more about what OT is, particularly in Ireland, um, the Association of Occupational Therapists of Ireland have a really good and well-resourced website looking at what OT is um, and kind of looking at kind of all the different aspects of occupational therapy. So if you'd like to check it out, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, you definitely covered a lot there in your presentation. And I actually wasn't aware of all the areas that OTs could work in. So um, it was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just conscious of time, everyone. So uh, I will put the cameras back on now. I think we will just jump straight to our next speaker. Um, it's nearly half past eight at this stage. So we're going to go to the area of social work. So Elaine Donnelly is a social worker in St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, and she's going to take over now. Thank you, Amanda. Now, that's a hard act to follow, Grace. You're very enthusiastic. I nearly want to become an OT now. Um, I'm LA Dolly. I'm the social work team leader based in uh, St. Pat's. I've been here for over 10 years now. Um, and I work alongside 12 social workers uh, in, in the hospital to provide social work services to a broad range of teams and specialities across the hospital. I'm going to share a screen now. I uh, Just a short presentation, I suppose. I'll try and keep a brief banda as best I can. Um, so I suppose most people, when they think of social work, what they know of our profession is mostly around child protection and child welfare. And um, so that's the public face of social work. And it's often what we see in the East Enders and Coronation Street and the like. But we know that social work is, is much broader than that. And uh, we work in a broad range of, of settings and, and uh, practice areas. So just to start with, I might... Um, I, I might share the definition of social work because a lot of people wouldn't be aware that we are a practice-based profession and an academic discipline that's really focused on social change and the development of social cohesion, uh, promoting uh, equality, the empowerment and liberation of people. And we're really focused on the principles of social justice and human rights. So we're underpinned by theories of social work, social sciences, humanities, psychology, and social work really engages with people and structures to address the life challenges and enhance their well-being. So very wordy, and um, but it covers a lot in that. And I suppose it, it focuses on uh, the areas of our practice, which is really essentially about promoting human rights and promoting equality of access to services for all people in society so within that I suppose we work with in a broad range of settings so as I mentioned there so um, I would have previously worked in probation services I would have worked in community mental health services I would have worked as a refugee case manager in the Red Cross and um, so I've done a lot of variety a big variety of work um, in my work as a social worker so you can work in lots of lots of different areas so you can work in adoption and fostering you work in children in care you could work in children and adolescent mental health 
disability safeguarding either social workers in the housing authority so in homeless areas there's social workers in hospitals in um, postnatal services so in primary care in probation in direct provision in addiction services so uh, there's a real broad range of areas that you can work in when you become a social worker and really what that reflects is that our profession is dedicated towards promoting human rights and protecting the most vulnerable in society so that's why a lot of you who might know about social work will hear about protect our protect our role in protecting children but also in safeguarding vulnerable adults and older people who may be at risk of abuse so that is certainly a big part of our role but really what underpins that role is our focus on human rights and our focus on social justice so within that mental health policy you've heard a lot with within the mental health system you've heard a lot about how other disciplines operate and how they focus on individual well-being and individual coping and your individual mental health and your individual occupation and we all work together as a team to take a holistic view of a person's mental health so that's really important that we're not just focusing on their symptoms and how they present but we're focusing on all areas of, it, of, of their life that we know will impact on your mental health so from a mental health perspective in for social work we are part of the core disciplines that are required by um, government and by the law um, and by the policy that's uh, uh, currently active at the minute called sharing the vision um, so within that within the team setting we have a particular focus on the on the person in their environment so not just you in the context of you you in the context of your family in context of your relationships your community your culture and um, your peers your friends how you interact with everybody around you um, and how often I suppose where you come from how you've grown up your what wider society has influenced your mental health so what we call the social determinants of your health and also the social implications of mental health and illness so if you have a mental health problem you're more likely to encounter difficulties in accessing the support services that you need and you're more likely to encounter the effects of stigma and discrimination so social work would be very aware of that and i suppose we take a key role in advocating for people's rights and promoting uh, the rights of service users to participate and have choice in mental health services. So really our practice begins with the individual, but then extends out to the family, to the social networks, to the community and to the broader society, all with a focus, I suppose, on recovery, strengths based. So we're focusing on drawing out people's own resources and strengths and how they've managed to date and how they can use those strengths, I suppose, to, to go on and to fulfill their recovery and to have a, a good quality of life. Um, so I suppose within that, um, and Grace talked about her, her day in the life of an OT, and similarly, a day in the life of a social worker is, is so varied. Usually I do know what I'm coming to because I, I know my diary at any given week, but, but certainly I suppose social work deals with a high level of complexity in the work that we deal with because we're often um, faced with dealing with high levels of trauma, high levels of domestic violence, um, child protection, concerns around safeguarding and um, homelessness ensuring adequate housing for people um, who, who may be suffering from mental health difficulties um, so lots of lots of really heavy you know complicated issues that we're dealing with and that's part of the social work skill set that we have to hold a lot of that complexity so within that I suppose we would often do what's called a psychosocial assessment so that takes account of all the different psychosocial factors that might impact on your mental health and may prevent you from making a full recovery but also will play an important role in your in your mental health uh, recovery going forward so we would have a strong role around service user and family advocacy which often makes us a difficult person to be at a team meeting with and um, because we're 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 always open for debate and, and trying to start discussion uh, we do supportive counseling so that's within our role um, and then we do family work we work with couples often doing parenting work and um, we do group work we run a lot of family programs within the hospital so that would be a core part of our work and um, we do as I mentioned work around housing so that would be a core key issue for people who have mental health difficulties it's very difficult to be well when you have don't have a stable place to live and um, as I said we take a lead role in child protection and welfare and that's really because we're concerned about protecting the most vulnerable and the people who have the least voice in society 
society. Um, so within that, we would work with families and we would work collaboratively with families to help them understand maybe if a parent has a mental health problem, how's that impacting on everybody else in the house? What kind of supports do we need, whether that's a small child, whether that's a teenager, what do they need uh, to understand and for everybody to be on the same page and to feel supported and to have stress minimized. So we also do a lot of advocacy work around accessing to essential social supports and financial supports that are really necessary for everyone to stay well and to be well. Um, and within that also, we would in the hospital, in the inpatient setting, we would do a lot of work around discharge planning. So making sure it's safe for somebody to return home, but not just safe, that, you know, that it's less isolated. Maybe that involves getting, you know, other services out to do home visits. Maybe it, it involves getting home care set up for an older person who might have mobility difficulties, for example. So it might be involved getting somebody involved in a support group and liaising with occupational therapy to see what kind of meaningful activities they have so I suppose it's quite broad in terms of how of, of the role we take from start to finish um, in terms of an inpatient admission um, so I suppose like all of the mental health disciplines uh, being a social worker is a really demanding job and it requires a variety of skills which are essential to our practice I suppose first and foremost you have to have a keen sense of empathy and human rights awareness so you have to be really focused on human rights and, and those strong interpersonal skills um, in tandem with that so we're very committed to social justice and, and having an interest in advocating for the most vulnerable in society is key um, so how how do you become a social worker? Um, so the title of social worker is a legally protected title and, and only those registered with KORU can use it. So KORU is the, is the uh, statutory board within Ireland that registers certain health and social care professionals. So um, you can only become a social worker through certain guaranteed routes. And there's two primary routes. So first you can go the undergrad, which is a four year course. Um, and it's a four years bachelor, which involves a placement every year. Um, a practice uh, placement is really core part of our training. Um, the majority of social workers, however, would have a basic undergraduate uh, graduate degree in a social science or related field, something like psychology um, or humanities, and then would go on to do a master's in social work. And a master's in social work is a two year course full time that requires 14 weeks unpaid um, practice placement every year. And um, so it's quite intense in terms terms of both the academic side and um, the professional practice piece as well. I currently have a student on place with me, with me at the moment, so she would shadow me throughout the day attending uh, different appointments and would also have her own caseload. Um, so that's how it's, it's a minimum of four years to qualify as a social worker, but typically it's about six or seven. Um, but it's definitely worth it because after you qualify, you have a broad range of skills and you have a qualification that's really versatile and that can lead you to, to lots of different settings and lots of interesting types of work. Um, so short and sweet, Amanda, but I think I'll finish it there. If, if anybody would like to know more about social work, they can um, go on the ISAW, the Irish Association of Social Work websites or indeed uh, pop a question in the chat. Thanks so much, Elaine. Um, there's some great information in there for any of our attendees who are interested in the area of social work. So thank you so much. I know you're going to hang around, Elaine, and answer a couple of questions from the Q&A box. Um, so we're going to just move swiftly on again to our last speaker. Um, please don't feel like we're ignoring your questions. As I said, we're going to go to the speakers after the event and they'll, um, or at the end of the event, I should say, and they're going to pull some questions from the, the Q&A box and answer them for you. So our last speaker of the night, last but not least, is Grania McGettigish. Grania is a pharmacist in St. Patrick's and you're going to do a lovely presentation on pharmacy for us. I a few slides. It'll be just a very, very brief overview on pharmacy and um, the role of the pharmacist and sort of you know, what um, subjects to do if you're interested in pharmacy in the sort of the college course. Um, so the role of the pharmacist. So pharmacy is the science and practice of medication preparation and supply. Um, it's a health profession that links health sciences with pharmaceutical sciences and aims to ensure the safe, effective and affordable use of drugs. Pharmacists aim to ensure patients' medications are appropriate, safe, legal, 
cost effective and rational and that the quality of care is enhanced and the risks associated with medicines. So if you have an interest in science or healthcare and good attention to detail, pharmacy you know, will be a good career option to consider. Um, it has good opportunities to mix clinical knowledge and communication skills. There's a variety of job options post-qualification with a relatively good salary, and there's good employment opportunities EU-wide. Um, now, there is exams uh, required to get into Australia and the US, and I think Canada is also an option. You can do sort of further exams and a further intern year and work in Canada. So how to become a pharmacist? Um, so it's a five-year integrated bachelor and master's degree program in pharmacy that includes practice placements throughout the five years. Work experience in community, hospital and industry occurs throughout the course, including a four month placement in fourth year and an eight, eight month placement in the final fifth year. And currently there's three schools of pharmacy in Ireland. Um, so Trinity College Dublin, the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland and University College Cork. And I've just left links there in the slides to the different um, colleges, their web pages about pharmacy, about the pharmacy course. Um, so I think Amanda was saying that she might put that into the chat box so that you have access to that. Um, also, I'm happy to add those links. I just, I can't see your oh, yeah. presentation. Oh yeah, sorry, no worries. I probably went firing away. No, it's fine. I mean, you're covering everything perfectly anyway, so it's absolutely fine. Just to have um, a visual to, to match what you're saying anyway. And I'm happy to share those links in the, the Q&A box. <laughs> I always skip the step of share screen. You're fine, Perfect. no worries at all. Uh, Sorry, so I don't want to mute now. So <laughs> I am so not tech savvy and that one step always gets me. So I think, is it sharing now? Sharing now, Grony. Yeah, don't worry about you it. Like, the screen? I have my camera on, so it's fine. <laughs> so you're sharing now, so you work away. <laughs> Sure now, okay, <laughs> perfect. So I'll just skip down. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's um, there's the links there for the three colleges um, that offer pharmacy in Ireland. Um, so that's just very useful, you know, for further information about, you know, what the individual colleges, you know, what they focus on. Um, largely the courses are going to be the same, you know, between the three colleges, you know, they'll obviously be quite a focus on chemistry, pharmaceutical science, um, pharmacology, physiology, and as well like pharmacy practice. Um, just to note as well that many universities in the UK offer pharmacy courses and you apply through um, a system called the UCAS system. Um, so the UCAS system, it's slightly different than the CAO. Um, different universities will have sort of more individual requirements. Um, sometimes you just kind of might have to write a brief statement about yourself and why you're interested in pharmacy and you may need references. The application in the UK, it's not as focused on the points system. Um, it's more of a sort of holistic application as such, um, where you know you write about yourself and like previous experience. Um, so if you are interested in kind of going down the UK, it would be best to probably to get in contact with individual universities um, that you're interested in, in attending because they have such sort of um, variability in their um, entry requirements. So I just did a table there on the uh, entry requirements for the three colleges in Ireland um, based on last year's points, 2020 entry points. The little asterisk just means, so if people, um, for RCSI, if you got 578 points, you weren't guaranteed a place. So I'll just go back there. You weren't guaranteed a place, but anyone that got 579 points did get a place. And then at 578, it was offered on random selection. Um, so that's just a little bit of an idea of kind of the points that you might have to achieve. Um, obviously in 2020, there was the predicted grades. So that probably had an influence um, over, you know, what, how the kind of the points went in terms of like demand and things. Um, so we just sort of to know that it's sort of like, you know, in the sort of the 500, you know, kind of 80 region is sort of what, what you're aiming for there. There's also just to note that um, chemistry is a requirement in um, the three colleges, apart from Trinity, uh, it requires chemistry or physics and chemistry um, as a subject. Uh, pharmacy is quite, in the undergrad in particular, um, it's quite chemistry based. So having sort of, if you do feel like that you're strong in chemistry, this would be a good career, you know, to pursue. Um, and then once you qualify, there are many different areas that you can go into. So there's community pharmacy, hospital pharmacy, industry, academia, 
and state bodies such as the HPRA, which is the Drug and Medicinal Product Licensing Board. Um, so I'm just going to focus a little bit on community and hospital um, because they're probably sort of the most clinical roles and they're the ones that I have, um, that I'm most familiar with. Um, in terms of industry, that would kind of involve you know, you'd be involved in the preparation of medicines and ensuring that the batches are safe and that they meet the quality standards. Academia, so a lot of people go on and pursue PhDs um, after pharmacy and, you know, there's sort of room for like pursuing kind of masters and further education. And then state bodies such as the HPRA, so that would be regulatory, so you'd be kind of looking at um, sort of the literature that different companies produce in relation to bringing a drug to the market and you'd be deciding whether it's safe or whether the drug should get a license. And so community pharmacy is probably the one you're probably all familiar with. It is often the first point of call in the healthcare system. Uh, pharmacists in community, um, they give advice on minor illnesses such as colds and rashes. They dispense medications on foot of prescriptions. So we have a close working relationship with GPs. You offer information about medicines, you know, the side effects and medication interactions. And you can also provide extra services such as the flu vaccine, blood pressure checks, cholesterol testing, uh, weight loss programs, and smoking cessation. Um, so in the last sort of number of years, pharmacy is becoming sort of very much a service kind of driven um, role as well as just the supply of medicines. There is kind of the role of the pharmacist is expanding to include a lot of um, services. You know, the flu vaccine is, you know, kind of recent years is kind of one of the biggest services provided in community pharmacies. And then in hospital pharmacy, there's well is many aspects. So you, there's like the dispensary, there's clinical um, role, medicines information, and aseptics and camp and compounding. So medicines information would be providing information to other healthcare professionals about medicines. You know, you might get um, a query about whether a drug is safe to use in pregnancy or breastfeeding, and you have to review the literature and you know take into account sort of details about the patient um, and sort of help aid um, healthcare professionals in their sort of inquiry whether a medicine is safe or appropriate and aseptics, aseptics and compounding would be a lot to do with um, chemotherapy drugs. Um, so the clinical role, you know, you, you work as part of a healthcare team to ensure safe, effective and economic delivery of drug treatment and um, you confirm the patient's prior medications on admission to hospital and advise adjusting therapy is necessary depending on the reason for admission. You get to participate in ward rounds. There's intervening to improve uh, drug prescribing. You provide training to nurses and medical students. You contribute to research activities and you can educate patients about medications. Hospital pharmacy um, in particular has great op uh, training opportunities. You work as part of a large healthcare team. Um, so in St. Pat's, we have um, a large pharmacy team. So you get to interact with other pharmacists, pharmacy technicians. You also get to act, interact with other members from other disciplines, such as, you know, occupational therapists and nurses and doctors and, you know, social workers. So you do, you get to learn a lot from other um, healthcare professionals. You can also um, pursue further training in terms of a master's in clinical or hospital pharmacy. And this is generally a two or three year course after, um, after your undergraduate degree. Uh, often you will sort of do this sort of, sort of remote learning um, where you will be working, you know, generally um, full time and completing your um, master's degree sort of at the same time, sort of online work, uh, online assignments and things like that. Uh, hospital pharmacy is also great because you can specialize in a particular area that interests you. So you can sort of go into hematology or nephrology um, you know, infectious diseases or mental health, um, mental health particularly, um, there's such a wide variety of drugs um, available and they all have sort of different side effect profiles. So the role of the pharmacist, you know, is very important in kind of advising, you know, the patient, um, you know, about various side effects and sort of, you know, what might suit them in particular. And that's kind of everything then. It's just a very, very brief overview of pharmacy and, you um, I'd be willing to answer any questions. Thanks, Amelia Grania. I wouldn't say that was brief at all. I think you covered a lot in that presentation. And for any um, students that are interested in, in pharmacy, I know they'll definitely take a lot from that. Um, thank you again. So what we're going to do now is go back to the start um, of our speaker list. 
So um, I know Paul couldn't stay for the Q&A, so he's already answered a couple of questions for us, but we're going to move on to the next speaker, which is Neve Wallace, or Willis, should I say. Um, Neve is going to answer a couple of questions that were sent in um, in relation to psychology. So was there um, a couple of commonly asked questions or... Yeah. Um, yeah, do you want to go ahead, Neve? Yeah, no problem. Um, I think there was a few questions just around... Um, I suppose how you get into a, a career in in psychology and in clinical psychology in particular so i'll just um kind of go through that briefly so generally people do um, a psychology degree which is a very very broad kind of introduction into basic psychological principles and an introduction to research methods and that kind of thing and if people are looking to have a career as a clinical or counseling psychologist and work in a mental health setting they then 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 go on to do a masters and they might do a masters in like mental health like I did which is more specialist some people do masters in neuropsychology some people do masters in research to to kind of improve their research skills and after that then after they have their their masters people look for assistant psychology posts and people work in assistant psychology posts for anything from like a year to four or five years and during that time they apply to get on training um, either clinical or, or counseling training if they want to work in those branches in a, in a mental health um, discipline and that takes uh, when you do your doctorate then it takes three years so it's a three years of an undergraduate degree uh, a year of a master's uh, any kind of various kind of d amount of years they're working as assistant psychologist and then three years uh, doctor level training so that's kind of the the length of time um, and the kind of career road to to clinical or counseling psychology just to say there's clinical uh, doctoral programs in trinity ucd in uig in ul and ucc and there's one counseling doctor program in trinity college uh, dublin so that's where the the kind of doctor level um, training is available and um, so that's the kind of road um, and another question was somebody asked about um, through a psychology degree can you go about researching brain disorders and behaviors and why we act and um, the way we act so yeah absolutely a lot of people will do a psychology degree uh, and then decide you know I don't actually want to go into clinical practice and train to be a clinical or counseling psychologist but I'm really interested in the area of psychology so what they might do then is they might do a master's and um, to, to specialize in an area that they might be more interested in like you know neuro areas or they might decide to do a PhD uh, and then there are people who work as research psychologists so they don't work in clinical practice but they do work in research uh, and they would spend their time doing that kind of work researching you know brain disorders and behavior and all sorts of various areas uh, within psychology so people do go on and do PhD and um, which is where they work in research uh, and they don't go down the doctor's route which is the the clinical practice route that you would go down if you wanted to work in somewhere like um, St. Patrick's services so I think that was kind of the the flavor of the majority of the questions that came in. Thanks Eve. I know there were lots of questions so thank you so much for nominating it down no for us um, and there were great responses as well. Um, so we're going to move on to Grace Adams, who um, covered nursing this evening. Grace, did you pull a couple of questions from the Q&A tab for us? Um, yes, I did. Um, so there were um, a few that kind of overlapped with regards to stress and how to deal with um, possibly difficult situations, whether a service user might be non-compliant or um, not to engaging um, and how do you manage that um, I suppose that comes back to empathy being in hospital is a very difficult thing for people and um, there's a reason why they're behaving like this why they don't want to engage it's difficult for them so it's up to us to make it as easy and um, as straightforward and linear as we can for them um, and then with regards to stress um, when it's the same thing again when the service user is acting like that or if we if we become um stressed in the job the thing you have to remember is that it's actually rarely about us we're we're rarely the the sole cause of the the service user feeling like this and um, so it's again having a compassionate um approach um and just being able to switch off when you leave work is um, an art, but it's something you have to learn to do um, for self-preservation basically. Um, so those were the main things. The other one I just want to touch on is in relation to how do you get into CAMS, which is child and adolescent mental health services. So that's just something you can apply for. You can apply for those jobs once you become a qualified mental health nurse. 
Um, in St. Pat's, you get the opportunity to have placements when you train in St. Pat's. Um, you get experience on Willow Grove, as I mentioned before. So they have separate interviews to um, the general adult area in Pat's. So I hope that answers those for you. Thanks a million, Grace. Really appreciate it. Um, again, I know there was lots of questions for nursing as well. So our next speaker to um, answer a couple of questions is in the area of occupational therapy. So Grace Tully, whenever you're ready, if you want to um, answer a couple of questions that came in. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. There's just a couple of them around the entry requirements for either the undergrads or the postgrad. The best thing to do is contact your guidance counsellor or look at the websites, the college specific websites, they, they kind of detail in detail kind of what the entry requirements are, what the equivalents are and different things. So the best thing to do is actually go to the universities and look up the courses online. Um, one or two came questions in about kind of how we actually look at life outside of work. And I know Grace touched on this about switching off added profit. And it is something that I suppose when you do work in healthcare and you do work as in we do placements so I suppose as students you do actually start to learn skills and you're taught skills and you're actually you discuss it quite a lot about actually how do we take care of ourselves and how do we actually keep ourselves well outside of work that allows us then to do our work well so having time for friends family having time for hobbies having time to relax and switch off is all a big part of what we do and something that we're very aware of and definitely working together as a team we're very much geared on that so it's something you do get quite a lot of support around. And the last question just came in around specialised training, depending on if you whatever area you're working. It, it depends on where you work. Some OTs move around quite a lot between physical, mental health and different services. Others stay for a while and maybe become more specialised and kind of start to do a lot more training in that area, depending on what's available. So it just depends on where you work and what skills um, and strategies or assessments you want to be able to learn to do. And that's all kind of happens after you graduate. So I think that was the main questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Grace. Really appreciate it. Um, we're back to Elaine now, Elaine Donnelly, for um, social work. Hi, Amanda. Yeah, I just had, there's a few kind of similar ones within the q and I suppose the first thing was, again, like Grace um, and two Graces have said uh, about the demands of the job and the, and the stress of working within mental health services. I suppose that's a, a, a it's it's for you as an individual I suppose to obviously have a certain skill set to be able to manage stress and develop ways and resources that you can cope within a demanding job but it's also for your team around you and for the organization within you within which you work to respond to to any kind of demands that you have in your job and to create a supportive culture that makes it much less challenging to do a challenging job so that like as part of my role I would have a clinical supervision I would also have brief supervision and I would also have like regular peer support um, and uh, check-ins with my team so there's there's lots of support there to do the job uh, so if you're worried about the stress in itself I, I wouldn't let that put you off and that there's there's lots of resources that can be can be found within the within the setting uh, to help you um, to help you manage the other thing was somebody mentioned about is there jobs available Social workers are in high demand in Ireland in particular. We have a shortage of social workers, so there is lots of jobs um, available after you qualify. Um, and somebody mentioned, are you often the bad one in the family <laughs> when you're working with families? Um, that, like, that, that's, I suppose, goes back to uh, the perception of social work in the media. That's not my experience. My experience is that once you get down into working with people and they can see that you're committed to their best interests and committed to promoting their rights um, that, and you'll work with them um, in, with, with them collaboratively and it usually gets on very well in my experience. So that was the main ones, Amanda. Brilliant, thank you so much, Elaine. Great answers. And um, back to Bronya again. Bronya, are you okay to answer a couple of questions? Um, I am. Um, I was just checking in the, the box there. I don't see, see anything particularly aimed at pharmacy. Um, but again, you know, if someone has any questions and they want to, um, I think, Amanda, did you mention, was the, is there an email address that, that they have access Yeah, to? and I'll call it out then when we finish as well. It's just info at yeah. walkinmyshoes.ie. And if anyone wants Perfect. to direct any questions for pharmacy for Bronya to answer, um, Bronya, that'd be brilliant then if you could get back to me and I'll, I'll forward on the answers. Brilliant. Perfect. I'll do Fantastic. That. Thank you so much, Grania. Um, okay, nice. guys, we're ready to uh, finish up. I think we've about a minute to go, so we're really stuck to time this evening. 
I just want to say thank you so much to all of our presenters for taking time out of their evenings to join us to do this talk for, uh, for students, school staff and parents. We really appreciate it and it's, it's very obvious that you're passionate about your jobs. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, I will say if you are considering, this is for students, if you are considering a career in the area of mental health, we hope in a few years when you're qualified, you'll check out the career section on stpatricks.ie and we'd be happy to have you work with us. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to add a feedback survey to the Q&A box now. We'd love to get your feedback on this event. Um, we hope to do events like this in the future. So if you could give us any sort of feedback, we'd really appreciate it. And um, as I said there to Gronia, if you have any further questions or anything you just want to get in touch, you can just contact me in Walk My Shoes at info at walkinmyshoes.ie. Um, after that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you.